All right, we're live. It is Black Hat 2019, our first interview of the week, and it's a pretty big one. So we're going to be talking to Adam Kujawa. He is the director of Malwarebytes Labs. Now, we all know who Malwarebytes are, so we're not going to talk about that part, but you might not know what the labs division does, and today we're all going to find out. Plus, we're going to tell you about some breaking information that uh, they're going to release just today, Thursday. So, Adam, thanks for the time. Thanks for having me. So, outside of the obvious with Malwarebytes, what most of us in the IT field know about you, tell us about what the Labs division does and what you guys are responsible for. Yeah, sure thing. So, Malwarebytes Labs is kind of our uh, R&D department, in a way. We do all the deep analysis of the, the threats that you know we're seeing out there, anything that we have to reverse engineer or tear apart traffic for. We build a lot of the new technologies to go after the latest threats in there that before they get included in our engines. And we report on stuff. We write, we write reports. We write blogs. The entire Malwarebytes uh, Labs blog all belongs to us. And, um, yeah, we just try to keep people informed and educated. When the average IT person or even home-based user you know, downloads the Malwarebytes tool and tries to de-garbage all of their stuff, how much of what's there are you guys involved with? Uh, well, a big part of what we do is is the uh, guidance on our engineering team and our, for our researchers. We've got people who are devoted to uh, looking at malware samples that come in that may not be um, identified by our automated means, by our heuristic detections and stuff like that. Uh, but we're able to do things like uh, like tear them apart, like I said, the, the malware a little bit more to give more information to our researchers, but we also do uh, a lot of our expertise and our findings to help and advise where our product's going and what new technologies we need. If an independent researcher or some IT person or just an average consumer were to submit something, whatever that something is, to, uh, to Malwarebytes as a whole, does that come to you guys? How... How important is that for you guys to investigate everything, or do you tend to find the same repetitive type of things coming into your group? Well, we have kind of uh, trusted sources as far as who we accept samples from. Um, we don't just blindly accept samples from everywhere. We also, some of our technologies do send back samples of things we detect. Like, for instance, our anti-ransomware technology will identify ransomware based on behavior only. It's not looking for any names or signatures or anything, just it's doing A, B, and C, and therefore it's probably ransomware, so let's kill it. And if we don't recognize it, then we send it back uh, back to our researchers to delve into deeper and to make sure that you know we can absolutely get it, as well as get detections for it outside of just uh, behavioral heuristics, but actually looking for that particular family. So now that we get the easy stuff out of the way, let's talk about like the hard stuff. You know, what now are you guys seeing that is just like, holy crap, amazing or just surprisingly crafty? You know, we all know that these uh, the bad actors are trying new methods and new uh, vectors. What are you guys seeing that's making you have to stop and think, okay, we need to take a new direction or we need to figure out a new thing, whatever that thing is? Well, I mean, ransomware has become more of a problem. Uh, we're, we're just releasing our quarterly report. This one is all about ransomware in particular, uh, where we take a look at the, the threats that we've seen ransomware-wise over the last few years, and specifically over the last year. But what we've mainly been seeing over the last six months is a massive amount of ransomware going after enterprises, businesses, hospitals, schools. Uh, obviously, you could read the news, see all the attacks above the municipal networks. And at the same time, we've seen a drop of that kind of threat against consumers. Um, this has never really happened. In the past, it was mainly ransomware went out there. It, uh, it cast a very wide net with phishing attacks, phishing campaigns, attempting to get anybody they could. Um, but these days, going after consumers, going after an individual system isn't worth it anymore. The return on investment isn't there. So the bad guys, they want to be able to not only ransom files that are critical, but also ensure that they're going to get payment. So going after a user who may be all right getting rid of their you know, pet photos or something like that because they got ransomware, um, when you flip that around and say uh, an entire organization gets ransomed, some critical files could be customer data, could be, you know, um, 
uh, intellectual property or other things that are needed for that particular organization to keep running or not get fined by a government. Um, and so they really have fewer choices than the consumer does. But at the same time, this does allow for the attackers to ask for higher ransoms and they have more of a it's not a guarantee, but they're more likely to get paid going after a business than just a regular person. You know, so now that you've mentioned those organizations, those types, you know, in the news more recently, of course, the city of Baltimore, a couple of cities in Florida. We know that some of these municipalities have actually paid. Of course, healthcare organizations are getting crushed and a lot of them are starting to pay, you know, clearly backing up data and uh, being able to restore and having a plan is always the best option. But is there a time where as an organization, if somebody reaches out to you or or whatever, that you're actually suggesting that they pay? Or are you just saying, hey, you're probably going to be a target more. Don't do that. (laughs) Well, what we used to do when ransomware first became a bigger problem back in 2012, 2013, um, was tell people don't pay. Say don't pay. You're just going to encourage them. It's just going to you know reinforce the idea that this is a good method of attack. Well, nobody listened, and we saw ransomware just go rampant. So these days, it's more about the individual case. I'm not. We're not going to tell anybody you shouldn't pay. Period. If you are in a situation where it's going to be more costly to not pay, like for instance with Baltimore. Um, then in those situations, maybe you can negotiate with a cyber criminal for a lower ransom or, or do something. I mean, at the end of the day, if you can't afford to lose those files, then you can't afford to lose those files. And we understand that. So, like I said, it's a case-by-case basis. So you mentioned, of course, the timing, 2012 era, when this stuff started kind of becoming a thing. And then now it's a daily business model for some of these criminals. How are you, how are, how is Malwarebytes specifically and, and the IT industry maybe in general, how are we going to address moving forward with prevention? Uh, clearly training, user training is one thing, but is there currently a combination of technologies or is there coming soon technologies that can help prevent this stuff better and cause the, the cyber criminals to have to try a new thing? Well, you know, we've taken a lot of different approaches to this. We've talked to people in the past and said, learn how to recognize a phishing attack, learn how to recognize where you might encounter malware. And that works sometimes, but over overall, it really doesn't. Because um, folks keep falling for the, the same old method of infection. Phishing attacks have been popular and one of the most popular ways of spreading malware for like 20 years. So it's, it's still an effective method of doing that. Um, but what we want to tell people these days is that we need to have more than just you, you check off your box saying, I have something to prevent malware from, from executing on my system or on my network. Instead, you have to prepare for that threat. Because bad guys are getting through every single crevice you can find. You know, while we do see a lot of phishing attacks, there are, there are ransomware families that are spread through exploit kits still, through malvertising attacks. And then we actually see cyber criminals breaking into networks through, like, insecure RDP ports or, you know, God forbid they still have an internal blue uh, vulnerability that can be exploited. And so they can manually get into the networks, disable security, and then launch the malware with the, the Robin Hood attacks. Those are that's and Sam Sam too. Those are two families of ransomware that we don't really see distributed out on the internet in the wild, but we hear about them and we see specific cases where attackers have launched them manually. So we want to try and, and create more of an environment that is focused on prevention, on preparing for an attack, not necessarily to stop it, but to get back up and running again. So that means identifying most valuable data in your organization, you know, figuring out how you can put that data either into, you make sure that stuff gets backed up or put it behind additional uh, security measures like multi-factor authentication or additional firewall. In many cases, cyber criminals will just go after low-hanging fruit. So they'll be okay saying, all right, well, we can't get to that thing, but don't worry about it. We'll move on. Um, so when you combine that with, with things like uh, offering your employees uh, an option on how to report a suspicious email, it doesn't mean they have to recognize it as a fish. They can just say, this thing looks kind of weird. 
and they send it off to an email address. At Mauerbytes, we have that, where if an employee sees, says, sees a phishing attack or they think it's a phishing attack, it's phishing at Mauerbytes.com. You know, we, we forward it on, and our security team takes a look at it and, and investigates it, and if it's something bad or malicious, then, you know, they can alert the rest of the company. But if it's nothing, then they'll let the user know. So, I mean, regardless... More experienced eyes are looking at these things. So, like I said, you combine those kind of factors with the the overall. You want to try and prevent it from happening in the first place, and you do that with multiple, you know, security technologies: anti exploit, anti ransomware, you know, anti malware. <laughs> um, and you've got a good chance of of being able to avoid uh, disaster. Really, we all know, of course, and we've just been speaking a lot about ransomware. But there are other things, you know, that are kind of recent last couple of years maybe uh, crypto mining new methods of, of vulnerability by just visiting a website nowadays it used to be click an email download an attachment now we're getting to attack vectors that require the user to do nothing but visit a website and like you said malwaretizing and other types of methodologies what what new vectors are out now that you guys are still researching, figuring out ways to go, what should security people as a whole start being prepared for if we can't get the users to stop clicking things? What can we do in the field to help protect our corporations as best as we can? Well, like I said, data segmentation, knowing where all of your endpoints are, what they're doing, how they're connected, having a plan in place in order to you know segment them or, or separate them if needed be. Uh, from an attack. But yeah, I mean, we see a lot of development over the last couple of years with, and this is going to sound crazy, but with phishing attacks, but not necessarily there's a link in an email anymore. They, they've, they If you go back enough years, a lot of malware used to be spread through office documents that was just the code itself of the document was modified with, with a little jump to a malicious chunk of code. And when the user opened it up, it would execute that code. Today, with uh, the XML format that Windows or uh, Office 2000 2013 and up use pretty much. Um, what we see more of is the use of macros, but not just macros, macros that pull up a JavaScript or a PowerShell script and then will grab the, the malicious file they need from the internet, pull it down, and, and launch it right there. So that's, you know, not necessarily uh, a novel tactic, but we see them trying new things all the time, trying to evolve how effective this is. The actual attacks themselves, the social engineering aspect of it is really impressive um, because you can't just open up a document. And, and for most people, they should have their, their office uh, set to not automatically launch macros, right? But if you put on something onto the actual body of the, of the document that looks legitimate and says, uh, hey, we're using an outdated you're using an outdated version of Office, or this was created with a different version. You know, you need to make it compatible. So click on the yellow, you know, button, and it'll launch the script. Everything else will happen. But, yeah, we still see exploits uh, being developed, new ones for, there's a new one for IE, for Flash. Uh, I think Edge has a couple of them that came out earlier this year. So we see exploit kits utilizing these primarily um, in the eastern part of the world, more so than the West. The, we saw a big, big, heavy push of ransomware, or I mean, of, of malvertising and of exploit kits in 2014, 2013. Um, and then it kind of slowed down, like you said, with uh, the crypto mining. By two, 2017, a lot of malware had just gone underground, and we saw nothing but crypto miners. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're always finding new ways of infecting us. As we get to the end of this, this interview, what What can, what, what should, that's probably the better word, what should the average person do about their mobile things, tablets and cell phones? I mean, we're primarily telling people about their computers and network devices, but more and more now we're allowing BYOD stuff personally owned to come in, and some companies don't even take a look at those devices before saying, yes, you can connect. So w- what should people be doing from a corporate level and even as an individual if you're going to take your device to work you know you don't want to be that one person that we all point to and say you're the source right you're you're patient zero so what should the individuals be doing and what should the corporate it people be doing to keep that part of the um the attack vector out of the equation 
Well, when it comes to mobile, you're right. There are a lot. There's more and more threats every day. We see mobile ransomware, um, and and with the BIOD, you know, methodology. I've, I'm personally against it. It sounds like a terrible idea. But if you have to do it, then you know, an organization can get a site license or something for their employees to install some sort of security on their phones. You know, there's lots of different applications out there. Malwarebytes has a couple of them. There's, I mean, a lot of other vendors have their own mobile versions, which you should be able to, to roll out and at least help to get rid of, like, the low-hanging fruit, the easy malware. It may not stop some state-sponsored, you know, attacker from spying on you, but it's, it's kind of a, a better way to avoid most of the crap that's out there. In addition to that, the actual organization itself could deploy uh, like an internet-only network, like a wireless network. If you're going to connect your phone to anything and you just need to get online or something, then that's what that network is for. You know, It's not for putting secure files. It's not for doing work. It's just for having it on in the background. And, um, I mean, those are kind of two of solutions that I've seen you know, deployed, or at least one solution I've seen deployed uh, in the real world, and, it, and it's worked out pretty well. All right, so I'm going to let you go in just a moment. I know you've got a lot to do. So what's what's the last thing uh, of of all the things that we just talked about? What what can you look at me and say, Dave? You're supposed to ask me about this thing, or we're doing this great research about that thing, and why didn't you ask me? Tell us something about what you guys are doing as a whole to target us to save us from ourselves. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a lot of technology, a lot of effort being put into the development of, of AI-type technologies, so a lot more machine learning. Um, a lot of our engines and our new products or new things that we're going to be putting into our engines rely on heuristics, on behavior, and a lot of the market's going in this direction because the amount of malware that we're seeing is just exceeding what humans can possibly deal with. And you can also, you know, muse on the idea of AI being utilized with malware, but that should also kind of jump it all up to a, a higher level of, of a higher degree of infections. So we need to combat fire with fire, basically. Um, but I mean, other than that, you know, as far as the report goes, we we saw a about 50 percent of all ransomware attacks target the U.S. or North America uh, overall. And some of the biggest states that we saw with ransomware infections were Texas, New York, California. Um, some of the infections that are in there make a lot, a little bit more sense. Saying California, for example, is more affected by consumer-focused ransomware, while Texas, which is as big industries, a lot of military bases, deal more with uh, with business-focused ransomware. Um, and then overall, I mean, what we're looking at for the future. Uh, this is not a threat that's going to go away. It's been too effective. It's gotten way too much press, unfortunately. <laughs> I've benefited from that. I'm probably half the problem. But <laughs> um, but the real concern is that we're going to see more ransomware that is stealthy, more ransomware that utilizes new technologies or, or kind of combines methods of attack from just being a simple malware that encrypts things to being a ransom worm or a Trojan that downloads additional threats. Um, and you combine that with the with the growing trend of what is called ransomware as a service, which is basically uh, a, a person builds the ransomware and then has affiliates to spread that ransomware, and then everyone gets a everyone gets a percentage of the ransom that gets paid. Um, but it worked out for some of the biggest ransomware families we've seen over the years, uh, and we expect that to continue as far as trends go. Which means that we can't really rely on well, this one family uh, attacks people this one way because it's never. It's not the case anymore. Um, and just be alert, you know, be, be aware and, and be observant. I think you just eliminated about half of the population. The, the whole be alert. It seems like we are having so much alert fatigue, uh, either as IT practitioners or the users are tired of seeing IT send out an email or a training video or something telling you about don't click. And that, that seems to be the hardest part that I experience in IT is getting my users to actually pay attention. So I try big, scary subject lines. Uh, I try bribes with your $100 is waiting for you or something like that, but uh, all, all in jest. Um, as we say goodbye, uh, how can someone reach out if, if they want to either from a perspective of buying products or a uh, research blogs or anything that you guys are doing? How can someone follow you guys, track you down, read about what you're doing. 
Yeah, well, our main website is myrobites.com. You can go there and see, you know, offerings for our consumers, for our business. We can get you trials. We can get you uh, in the contact with people that can, can help you out as far as setting up Myrobites on your location. But for research purposes, blog.myrobites.com, that's where we post uh, all of our, our best research, the guys that are that are working on those teams, uh, on our teams, in order to tear apart this malware. Sometimes we have articles that are high level that you can share with your grandmother or your, you know, friends and family. Sometimes we have uh, lower level uh, posts where we we go deep dive into certain malware families, how they work, what they do, and what we expect to see in the future from them. Awesome. Well, Adam, thanks for scaring the hell out of the rest of us, and uh, we appreciate your time. Thanks, buddy. All right.